All right, so the business of Web3 is really going to be driven around the aspect of NFTs, collectibles, and maybe how the market starts to deal with these things. The big marketplace is what we'll be talking about today, and of course that is Amazon. And we're going to dive in deep. I think you guys are going to like this one. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back to the Tech Path. Before we get started, we're going to thank our sponsors here. If you guys are looking at doing cold stories, there's only one way to do that, and that is through Ledger. There's a couple of software uh, platforms out there. They've got Ledger Live, of course. Uh, I'll show you a little bit about that in a second. But they're introducing their Ledger Stack, which is the area that I think is the growth opportunity for Ledger. You, of course, can get the Nano, the Nano X, all that good stuff. Many things happening out there in the future of self-custody, and Ledger is leading the way. Just a quick view here on what you can do inside of Ledger Live. Let me show you guys a little bit about that. Noticing their marketplace right here. So their marketplace has some pretty cool applications. Uh, obviously a lot of financial applications, but the one that I'm interested in is Cometh. And this of course is gaming inside of the Ledger Live. So these are some of the things from an innovation standpoint that I think really work. If you guys want to use our discount code, make sure and click the link below and you can start enjoying things like Cometh and of course self custody, which is the way to go. And then we'll get right into it today because I want to jump over to a few things and welcome in a guest. This, of course, is Kate Irwin over from Decrypt. Great to have you back. Hi, thanks for having me. Hey, Kate. Okay, so Kate, we're going to run through a whole s slew of NFT stuff and then we'll talk about Amazon kind of rundown. I want to jump over here to a Crypto Slam real quick just to show a little bit of what seems to be a bottom that has may have occurred for NFTs with a lot of activity right now, starting to come back with both unique sellers and buyers really spiking here. So good, good numbers really overall in the NFT space. So it's interesting to see the timing starting to play into what's happening over here on Amazon. Uh, Amazon is launching its platform on April 24th. First of all, what do you make of this? Is this a good thing for the industry or do you think this is just a a slow and steady process that Amazon's going to start entering the waters. So it's really interesting to see which big tech companies are embracing crypto and which ones aren't. Um, Amazon has also partnered with Avalanche to develop some Web3 integrations there on more of the infrastructure side of things. So this isn't Amazon's first, you know, foray into Web3. They are very aware of, of Web3 and crypto and how everything works there. Um, Microsoft is also interested in Web3. A lot of these companies are exploring things. I mean, Google also as well. So I think Amazon is doing this to ultimately stay competitive in the space. They are much more open to Web3 than, you know, Apple, for example, which seems to be one of the, the only big tech companies that is, is shying away from Web3 completely. So super fascinating. And I'm not surprised at all to see that Amazon has, has gotten into NFTs and, and they've just, I'm sure they've seen OpenSea's volume and Blur's right. volume and, and they just felt like they maybe were leaving money on the table at that point to not get involved in, in that marketplace conversation. What impressed me was in the article, it went further into it. It says it's going to be available on the site uh, via a tab. And this is, to me, that's like golden space on the Amazon.com website. Because if you think of it, when you land on Amazon, most of the time you're in the marketplace for you know going into the, the goods and services, or you're going to Prime Video, which is the way I use it. And then now you're going to have a digital marketplace tab right there in the front. So you're not going to have to dib in, dig into these multi-level, you know, <laughs> problems of trying to find something on Amazon, which is what I feel like. Um, so that to me shows that there is some consistency in their commitment of really kind of going in this direction. How big of a, how big of an impact do you think this would have on an open sea, a blur, you know, a magic Eden, et cetera? Do you think that will have any in the beginning or over time, it might start to see some movement over there? Yeah, so that's a great question. With Blur specifically, so Blur is kind of was marketed as like the OpenSea 
for power traders. It's it's really an NFT marketplace for the DGENs or or sort yeah. of the people that are just power trading assets. And they're not really collectors. They're more traders. They're trying to profit off of flipping these tokens for more money and, and placing bets on them and doing all this kinds of sort of DeFi, but with NFTs. And so that's what Blur is for. As far as I understand, OpenSea is more for the retail NFT collector and trader and investor and, and for a bit more casual audience, less hardcore. You know, we're not trying to flip huge, huge volume here in bulk necessarily on OpenSea. And so OpenSea is sort of like the place where everyone sort of dips their toes in the water. Now, Amazon might be able to steal some of that market share away because um, for, as far as I understand, Amazon's going to be a very retail facing, front right. facing, you know, very new customer base coming in, people sort of stumbling upon it being like, oh, what's this? You know, maybe some of like the Reddit type of audience, you know, with Reddit getting into those collectibles and being so successful with their with their Polygon avatars, mm -hmm. um, you know, and then seeing eBay do stuff as well. I think with Amazon's origins as a bookstore, you know, sort of bringing books to the internet, you know, and starting as like a bookstore and then becoming this like massive conglomerate that does everything in a way um, when it comes to online retail and e-commerce. I'm not surprised at all that they are they are getting into NFTs because they really just want to expand into as many potential markets as possible. So, so your thought is it's going to have some impact. We don't know how far the impact will be. The question will be back to your point, if we get new people into digital collectibles or if we're starting to see maybe traditional traders that maybe not the power trader, like what you might see on Blur, as you said, uh, but at least people that are inquiring or, you know, the casual trader of an NFT might say, okay, I'm going to jump over and see what's over on Amazon, uh, which could take yeah, some volume absolutely. away from OpenSea for sure. Yeah. And, and in terms of, you know, the NFT marketplace landscape more broadly, when we're talking about volume traded, which is a pretty decent indicator of average traffic and popularity of any given NFT marketplace, it's OpenSea versus Blur right now. And right. so all the other marketplaces are kind of considered very niche for very small sort of like one-off drops from artists or visual artists or sort of like the fine art world doing one-of-one -one trading and stuff like that. So all the other marketplaces are really not seeing any volume. Like we're talking like less than 1% each out of like a teeny tiny little pie. We're, we're seeing OpenSea and Blur take up the vast majority of all NFT uh, trading activity right now. And so, yeah, I think Amazon, just with their their web presence, their obviously huge brand recognition, like everyone knows what Amazon is, that will give them a leg up with their marketplace in ways yeah. that Coinbase NFT and Kraken NFT and like other NFT marketplaces being launched by, you know, crypto native companies. I think Amazon has a leg up for the retail investor market for sure. Yeah, I was looking at this, uh, you know, it's an awareness article on what is Amazon Amazon digital and how to sell products on it. Uh, and they made some interesting statements. I want to kind of scan down here under what qualifies, and I'll zoom up on that for you. Um, digital product, you know, virtual item, digital service. They're talking to, however, intangible products that you can't touch. It does have uh, a high value projected at around 331 mil in 2022. Video games make up the largest market segment uh, with a market volume projected around 175 mil in 2022. Other than video games, other big hitters include streaming media. This is all within the Amazon digital services side. So it's clear they see games as being one of the big factors here, which is a natural, obviously, with some of the NFT crowd and possibly an emergence of, of more games that would start utilizing Amazon maybe as a marketplace for NFTs. So that is interesting. And then further, you look at some of the digital media data here. I want to jump over to this chart. And just to show you, I'm kind of highlighting the just the video games there in the gray. Massive growth here, continuous growth, and really the the potential here for what we might see in NFTs. And I'm going to be out of GDC. We're going to be talking about this this whole conversion of traditional gaming versus you know Web three gaming. What that means. Do you think that Amazon could be kind of that new place that would serve both? titans, the growing Web3 market and the existing Fortnites of the world that may end up with some sort of digital collectible that could be used on Amazon. What are your thoughts there? 
Yeah, I think I think they want to be a part of everything if they can be. And so I'm not surprised that they also want to be involved in video games, right? I mean, yeah. we're seeing like the Epic Games Store, Steam, the these sort of big game launchers. We could see a lot more of those, to be honest. Mm -hmm. I mean, there aren't yeah. really that many out there. The mobile gaming market is super limited. It's very much bottlenecked between basically the Apple Store and the Google Play Store in terms of the, the app market. And that makes it difficult for some Web3 developers. And in terms of you know Web3 gaming more broadly, to sort of bring it back to that, Steam is, is not interested in Web3 games. So... I wouldn't be surprised if Amazon had a different approach to this and was more mm. open. Um, you know, I'm not really sure if that's their plan, but I think the what the the gaming space and the web3 gaming space, we just really need more platforms and eventually I think we'll get to the point where web3 games won't be siloed necessarily. It'll just all be gaming and it'll all just be yeah, under this sort sure. of common umbrella. And so, I mean, give, showing that data that you just shared it's interesting because I think that just sort of means like, yeah, they're lumping in like Web3 with just like digital sales, which mm. is correct. I mean, it's arguably it's, it's correct. That's what that's what crypto tokens yep. are. That's what NFTs For are. Sure. It's all just digital assets. Cool aspects around this AWS marketplace. Uh, they've got a whole line of customer success stories. You've got Sony in here on digital marketplaces. You've got uh, scenarios like Formula One you know, even one cup, then beamable, just, but the cool thing here, and I want to pop over, pop over to this, is kind of this whole idea of almost white labeling, because they're going to have these private marketplaces, which is interesting to me, because if you think about, I'm a, maybe I'm a creator, maybe I'm a small game company, maybe I'm just an NFT, you know, uh, collector, whatever it might be. The key is, is that we might start to see brand marketplaces all sorts of things, creator marketplaces, et cetera, almost like mini Etsy's, so to speak, that could play into this under these new private marketplaces. Would that change? Because that's not available quite yet as your own marketplace unless we saw a white label come off. I mean, there are those out there. I was thinking about Niftify and others that do those kinds of things, but it isn't within an overarching set where you have hundreds, hundreds of millions of people coming to it every day how much of an impact do you think those would be? The uh, the, the individual the private marketplaces, uh, yeah, marketplaces, yeah. That's fascinating. I'm I'm actually not super familiar with that, but just sort of in terms of like thinking about it in a crypto standpoint or from a Web three standpoint, there are a lot of blockchains out there that offer white glove service for sort of creating yeah. like private networks, walled mm -hmm. gardens for Web three developers. I mean, Avalanche is one of the biggest ones out there because you think about the Avalanche subnet, which is basically a private sort of sub network within the broader like Avalanche world but it's very much sort of severed off from the rest of it. And you can make bridges if you want, but it can really be a fully customized network that can be private enough that, you know, Avalanche says like the government is able to use it for things. <laughs> um, so, so that's just sort of an example of how theoretically we could have all these different, you know, blockchain networks um, selling different things or, or functioning for different companies in different ways. And so that partnership is something that I'm very curious to see if they end up going down that route, because it's yeah. not confirmed that that's necessarily what they will do. But, you know, when I just put two and two together, I think, oh, they want to make private marketplaces. And I think, oh, they just partnered with Avalanche, who offers private, basically private like blockchains in the form of a subnet. So really yeah. fascinating stuff. I, I can only speculate on, on what they're going to do. Well, strategy has been one that Amazon's been pretty uh, pretty good at o overall. I want to play a, a clip here. This came from the Code Conference. Uh, it's Kara Swisher uh, interviewing Andy Jassy, who's the uh, new CEO over at Amazon. Listen to what he had to say here when she pressed him a little bit. So you being able to sell and buy on a marketplace, that's the Amazon issue uh, primarily that they're looking at in Washington. With Apple, it's the App Store. Google, it's the search market. What is the sensible solution from your perspective to that? If we're looking forward, which I want to do, like what yeah. is uh, of these of these brands that are worried about? Uh, there's so many brands that are worried about being on Amazon. They don't know what you're going to do because you could do anything because you have such power in the online space. 
Well, again, I mean, I'm trying. I'm deciding whether I should take that bait or not. Okay, there. yeah, I think you should. <laughs> <laughs> I'm asking I mean, for a solution. I, 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 Eddie, I just want to. All right, so you can you can kind of hear she's she's got a, she got a good in on him in the sense of hey, a lot of brands, including I mean I think of it in the way of if we were to even take out an NFT, would I go to uh, a, a closed ecosystem like Amazon who has shown a little bit of a track record here, not necessarily uh, playing into? It. Do you think NFT creators will jump into this potential opportunity? What do you think? Oh yeah, absolutely. They're coming. I mean, create. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Creators want exposure. I think one of web three's biggest challenges is honestly the marketing problem and the PR problem. And yeah. so, you know, in order to really expand the economy for web three, for NFTs, you really just need some trust, trustworthy exposure. companies, you know, to come into the space and say like, Hey, yeah, we're doing this and this is why, and it's, you know, profitable for us. And, you know, here's what you get out of it and to sort of like lay it down for the average person. So I think I think creators will absolutely jump on this. I mean, not all like Web3 creators will be happy about this necessarily because I think there is still a sort of diehard group of Web3 natives who really want to be decentralized and yeah. they're trying to, st to stay away from big tech and big finance and like traditional, the traditional financial system of which Amazon is, is unequivocally like a part of it. Yeah. So I think some creators might take a stand, but... I think most creators are going to go where the money is. And if that's where the money is, then yeah, and I be think there. The, because, yeah, the, the scenario is also yeah. going to be fees. you got fees that will play into this. Obviously, with OpenSea, it's fairly low, you know, but again, it's a different kind of marketplace versus someone who's going in and you're probably getting access to a whole new set of collectors and potential NFT, um, you know, customers out there that would really kind of change the scenario. I mean, it's like what we see over on Substack. You know, if you think about Substack, you know, they take 10%. A lot of people would look at that who's a writer, someone like yourself, and say, wow, that's that's a lot if you actually build a, a pretty significant audience. Same thing with an NFT marketplace. If you build a significant volume, you know, you could see a pretty significant fee coming in on that. Speaking of that, they lost what their plan is is they're gonna launch their first 15 NFT collections on on the digital marketplace. The, uh, and this is all happening by April, I guess. There was a couple points that they stated here that I thought was interesting. They're suggesting that there's also a fidgetal aspect to this. This to me is very in intriguing because I've already seen this in the fashion space where you, you buy a, a good, a piece of fashion, whatever it might be, and you get the digital aspect, but also the physical aspect of it at the same time. That's a pretty cool component because now that gives them an advantage over all NFT marketplaces that are out there today because they do have that physical component. Here's an example, Steamboat Willie. This is a physical product that you'd be able to get. Now imagine that and then boom, there's the actual digital asset right there. All of that tied into maybe one marketplace could really change the way brands go to market, including fashion brands, pretty much any brand. I would think watches, anything out there that, that could really get into the collectible side. What are your thoughts on this fiddle component? Could Amazon become the new Titan there? Not that they uh, would, yes. they're not already. <laughs> yes, <laughs> that was I a, think that so. That was a softball. <laughs> 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 so in terms of like the whole fidgetal conversation, right? What's interesting about it is, so I think the pros of it and what makes it easier and to, and like you're going to more likely be successful in terms of like the pros of doing a fidgetal alongside the NFT. So you have the physical plus the digital. The plus is that you are clearly offering something to the first buyer, right? Whoever yeah. mints it in the primary sale is going to reap the reward, the physical benefits of, of that asset. So if it's a if it's a purse, you know, you get the, the NFT of the purse and then you get the physical purse, right? When you buy it in primary sales. So that is going to be like the average person who doesn't know what an NFT is, they're going to understand that concept of buying a physical asset, right? Because we all buy physical assets, but not a lot of people understand the value of digital art or digital assets quite just yet. I think for some people it's more intuitive than others, but other people, they can't wrap their heads around, you know, spending dollars on, on a piece of digital art. It's really difficult for them. And, and pros of having 
something that's physical is that it's to the first buyer. Oh, okay. I get a, I get a physical bag because of this. And then I also got the NFT as kind of like a bonus as like a certificate of authenticity, basically. Um, the con to that is, is from a creator standpoint is how do the secondary sales work? Can there mm-hmm. even be any secondary sales? Because the person who minted the item already has the physical item, right? Because they, right. they minted it. So they got the physical item. And and I couldn't imagine, you know, having a secondary sale and every single time it changes hands, you have to like ship the physical item around. Like that's not that's not how that's gonna go, right? Yeah. So what will end up happening, my prediction is there's gonna be way less creator royalties, which isn't really that big of a deal because we're already seeing creator royalties be circumvented by various platforms like Blur and like other places. But the the upside of that is is people are going to understand like, okay, yes, I understand why I'm buying this for $300 because the average person going to amazon.com is not going to understand why a piece of digital art is costing $300 unless they're getting something physical along with it. I look at it this way. You buy a watch. Uh, I, I'm a big watch collector. You buy a watch and if you get a full kit, which is all of the things that come with the watch, usually the warranty card, all those kind of things, that, that watch is worth more. Okay to the marketplace. But if you say, hey, I'm going to sell a Rolex or a Tudor or whatever it might be, and I'm going to put that out on the market with, it's not a full kit, it's watch only. It's going to draw, in most cases, anywhere between 10 and 20% lower in the open market. So I look at that and I think, if I had the digital good and the authentic good, physical, and I put that up on the market, I'm going, me as the seller, to resell that. I'd probably be able to, and I think in fashion goods, watches, purses, uh, you know, Cartier to Louboutin to, you know, anything in the fashion side of it, I think, one, people are going to start to realize, oh, this could up the value of it. So that would be intriguing of how that might change hands in the future and maybe create a new marketplace for Amazon. Listen, Amazon's going to kill on this. Someone else that's going to kill on this is eBay. Here's eBay's vault. Remember, we had this video not too long ago, guys, go back and check it out. We did a full rundown right there on how eBay and NFTs could potentially uh, take the market by storm. Color a couple of other things within this. Uh, right now on eBay, you can kind of see they're already showing the aspect of collectibles coming into these uh, scenarios. Right there is the virtual crypto and collectibles section. I won't click into that. It's basically uh, junk right now, but eventually that might be a nice area to go to. Uh, eBay, Amazon, you think about Etsy, you think about the potential with uh, other marketplaces that are very large. Do you think it's just going to be, this is going to be a natural explosion across all of them? Or do you think somebody's going to get really good at this and is going to win this space? So, yeah, I think there's going to be a couple winners that that come out on top. I mean, with eBay, I'm I'm less like bullish or or assuming that they are going to explode just because I think the eBay demographic skews a lot older and I think um the vast majority of NFT traders that I encounter are very young, very yeah. like hungry and and more interested in using web3 native platforms or more web3 design platforms like OpenSea, Blur, you know, all the different web3 marketplaces. I wonder, I wonder about eBay and, and if that will, will work out for them. I think the eBay's play, if I had to guess, it, it seems a bit more like what GameStop and Radio Shack are doing, right? Mm. They're kind of these older companies, these older sort of tech-focused companies that are looking for a way to rejuvenate their brand and capture a younger audience and hopefully pull some of them in. I know Radio Shack has like gotten into um, Web3 and GameStop has gotten into gaming NFTs and NFTs as well through Immutable. So I know that that's sort of what they're doing, but I'm not sure that that means that they're all going to like come out on top necessarily. I think there will be a few marketplaces that, that really succeed. The Coinbase NFT, um, I guess we could call it a failure now, that marketplace uh, has has struggled since day one. And it's a really fascinating case study to show you that not even one of the most successful crypto exchanges in the world can necessarily launch a successful marketplace because it needs to be appealing to users and it needs to really be incentivizing for users. In Web3, right. we have a lot of degens, a lot of traders, a lot of flippers who are purely in it for the money. 
And so they're not going to go to a platform like that, that is designed in a more sort of like web to like 2008 Facebook kind of social Mm. media type of angle, which is what I think they were going for there. But Amazon is a different case because I don't think they're going to be catering to the Web3 degens. I think Amazon's going to be catering to like the average person who may not even know what an NFT is. All right, I'm going to jump to a clip here. I was mentioning earlier, I think most media is going to be streaming, you know, uh, TV, film, most, yeah. um, you know, audio, music, and, and, you know, it, it's uh, even, I think over time, gaming, you know, I, I think most. All right, so streaming and gaming, that's that's what I'm getting at. Now, let's jump over here to Mini Royale. So this is a streaming game, and the cool aspect with this is the ability of utilizing these skins within Mini Royale in other places, obviously via the Ready Player Me. How, first of all, mobile, Web3, kind of somewhat lockstep. We haven't seen a lot of development there yet, but do you think this has a lot of runway to really kind of explode in the space of using things like these skins? I'm thinking Fortnite, et cetera, that could really kind of blow up like this. Yeah, in in terms of um, Ready Player Me, basically, as far as I understand, what they're trying to do is really create like interoperability so -hmm. that you can bring your avatar to different places. Um, So yeah, I think that's sort of the aim there, which is tying in with this like broader metaverse conversation of sort of having an avatar that you can take across multiple different games, um, applications or or like sort of virtual meeting spaces. I would say it's it's kind of it's interesting because we're seeing a lot of the big Hollywood studios actually pull back their budgets. Um, right. So they are trying to sort of reshift because now we're in this sort of po- post pandemic era, and so they're kind of re looking at their logs and saying, do we really need to be spending all this money on these shows? Yeah. So so in terms of gaming, I mean, we're seeing cloud gaming which allows you to use and play a more graphically intensive game on your mobile phone, on a browser, so that you can actually be on an iPhone or, you know, on a MacBook and just sort of be in your browser and be able to enjoy games. So so cloud gaming, um, from what I understand, is, is pretty different from like the broader stream. It's really important because that's, those are all each different mediums of entertainment that are competing yeah. for for user attention. Um, so in terms of cloud, it is very important because the hardcore gamers, like you were saying earlier about this like difference between the casual gamers and the hardcore gamers, you know, there are hardcore traders and casual traders as well in crypto and right. NFTs. And so the hardcore folks are the ones who have the funding client gear. So what cloud Gameables is it enables you to basically be playing a, a very nice game, but on a device that can't necessarily render all those graphics. So the rendering and stuff like that is being outsourced to to an external place. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be uh, I think intriguing because what we're seeing now is really kind of some new dynamics in terms of growth, both for gaming, but I think NFTs bring in just a unique spin to it. You know, if you look back here on the tweet that they were talking about with uh, Mini Nations, um, first time avatars game widely interoperable across these games is going to be part of a long term strategy. All right, so okay. here's an example. Here's an example. You can get this skin available on Magic Eden for the first time ever in the history of man. That's a new. That's a new spin on how this is going for sure. And. Could we see a lot of others kind of flow in this direction of using these kind of skins, including traditional games? It's exciting, and I'm happy that game developers are thinking about this. I'm happy that people are are trying to do this for users and for gamers so that you can have that asset and use it in more than one place. It's like having a dress, like a, a black dress, you know, that you can wear out to dinner, you can wear it on a date, you can wear it to lunch, you can wear it multiple different places. But in the digital world, you have to recreate that dress for every single occasion. <laughs> yeah, you can't just exactly. directly port it, obviously. It's a different case. Yeah, here's, for, uh, here's Forbes reporting on Epic revealing it made 50 million. This is on just one set of Fortnite skins, which I thought was interesting, which gets me back to that point. We were showing the skin actually being used over in Spatial earlier in some of that B-roll. And I think that to me, again, just opens up the opportunity of what these bigger game companies might end up doing. Uh, there's, you know, there's the example 
uh, right there uh, of that, you know, of Mini Royale being made, utilizing Ready Player Me and then flipping that right into Spatial. So it's kind of an interesting use case. The fact that we got so much money happening just on these skin sales within Fortnite, to me, again, this just, just steams opportunity for sure. Further into this, a lot of collaborations right now. You've got uh, Hangtime Bundle coming in with Air Jordans in this, real life Nike products coming in. Uh, also, you see the lineup here from Marvel, et cetera, all the way down to John Wick, Nike, et cetera. But I just think there's some very interesting aspects to how all of this plays out. Here's the, the actual, some of the Nikes that are coming into the game itself. And this is just showing some gameplay right here which was uh, Jump Man Zone. But again, that, uh, utilizing these kind of tool sets uh, for NFTs, creators inside of games, within that, being able to really kind of launch into the next gen on the marketplace side. Music NFTs, market size now, 2023 share, growing report, uh, really growing heavily, especially around some of the most recent things. This was a music NFT market size valued at around uh, 1.7 billion. Uh, in 2022, looking up uh, as high as much as $7 billion. So with this kind of growth kind of on the front line, do you think music NFTs are going to be a thing yet? We haven't completely seen this break out, though we have saw some things with Audius and Gala. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so music NFTs are are interesting. It It is very fandom-based. There are always, you know, the traders and the flippers who are just trying to quickly buy and sell, but we're also seeing like a lot of like true fandom come out of the music space. I don't know that they've necessarily cracked the like viral virality, like the viral content. Like how do we make these NFTs make headlines? You know, a lot yeah. of it is conversations around sort of shared royalties or music rights and and really sort of trying to restructure and flip the the royalty model on its head because a lot of artists don't like, you know, how much percentage of their revenue the big labels are taking from them. And so they want to sort of crowdsource their um, revenue and, and take a larger percent of the problem themselves so that they don't have to tour all the time. You know, like it was a, a little over a year ago that I, I wrote about how Steve Aoki said at this gala music event, he said like, oh yeah, I, I made more money just trading NFTs in the past so-and-so amount of time than I ever have with music advances. And that really spoke to just how desperately the music industry, the artists in the music industry need a web3 solution but it's really tough in terms of getting them for in, in terms of getting the fans to see a reason why they should buy the music because we sort of have lived in this in this situation where you have limited music um through and other platforms so it's it's right. tough out there for for the music industry and i think the the thing that i've heard again and again is just we need to just try to um, develop like a real use case for the fans. And, and so far, the use case that I've seen for the fans is they get a sense of being part of their artist community, their favorite artist community. Yeah. Because, you know, you look at like the Royal Drops and you look at, um, I think it's called Another Blocks Drop with the Rihanna song. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like those kinds of drops, you're not making your money back. You're not making your initial investment back. I think it I think if you bought it at Mint, another blocks Rihanna Mint at, at Mint, um, it would take you like 10 years to, to recoup the uh, the cost based on their estimated royalties. So those kinds of NFTs, like people buy them maybe because they're trying to make money, but they but you're not really going to unless you flip it right away. In terms yeah. of like actually getting royalty payments from those NFTs, it's a very small amount. And that's why the music business is so so tough and it's a really tough nut to crack for the for the nft developers in music space well it's all going to depend on on the marketplaces because i mean if you look at you know the aspect of streaming and where spotify has gone and, th and there's been some pushback within that. that's why we've seen all these other you know platforms like title etc that have tried to launch and then had some challenges but again you back to your point earlier in the show eventually there's going to be one or two titans that kind of resolve out of each of these scenarios I want to play one last clip from Bezos 
prior to Amazon actually getting through the dot bomb era. And he, he made a statement here in this clip that I thought was very interesting that may play out in the marketplaces for the future. Let me play this clip. Actually, so this space is a little different and brand name may, need, may mean more and, and, and there's some increasing returns kinds of things maybe more. But I believe that if you can focus obsessively enough on customer experience, selection, ease of use, low prices, more information to make uh, purchase decisions with, if you can give customers all that plus great customer service and with our uh, toys and electronics we have a 30 day uh, return policy. If you can do all of that, then I think you have a good chance. And that's what we're trying to do. All right, so he hits on something that turned out pretty good for Amazon, is that was really the thing that separated Amazon from every retailer in the country, in the world, and pretty much set them on to the front page of almost every phone, every phone on the planet, and has completely revamped the entire retail ecosystem. They were able to do that in less than 30 years. Now granted, as we look at the future of NFTs, gaming, all that, do you think his statement there could play out again? The one who gives the best experience wins in the end. Absolutely. I mean, it, it does come down to prices at the end of the day, but it also comes down to having a good UX and a good UI. Like there, right. you can't talk enough about how important it is that the user experience feels seamless, that you don't have to do so many clicks. You don't have to con do so many connections and pull up your phone and to authorize the transaction and then have your browser and then you're logged out of this site and you're logged out of that site. Like the simpler it for you obviously like the better and so i think that is where we're going um i really think that whoever has the best design will definitely have a leg up in terms of that but also in terms of ease of use i mean when it comes to web3 gaming which is kind of what i specialize in um i think the games that have the easiest smoothest fewest clicks in the onboarding process are going to be the ones that win if no you doubt. have to make me go to a website, buy an NFT, import this, import that, do all that, it's like, that's too many steps to just get to try your game. You know, I don't even know if I like your game yet. I just want to try it first. So I think that's going to be the experience. You know, it, it, it could be argued that buying an NFT is sort of a similar experience. Like you don't want right. to have to like jump through all these hoops just to buy it. You just kind of want to see what it's like. And it's like, I'm just collecting a piece of digital art. I don't want to have to go through 30 steps to, to do that. So yeah. it is going to matter a lot. I think you're right. All right, Kate, it's been great having you on today. Thank you again so much for stopping in. We appreciate it. Thank you. Excellent. All right, you guys, uh, if you're not part of the Diamond Circle yet, make sure and jump in. It is the one place where we drop a lot of additional content, research, all that good stuff. And plus, you get some access to even some of our own Crypto Power Index ratings. Uh, all that good stuff is available over there on our website. Just go to paulbarronnetwork.com. You can find all that good stuff. Make sure and click the link down below. We have a special offer for you on all of our Diamond Circle and our memberships that's only going through the weekend. So make sure and check that out. Of course, if you're listening over on the podcast, jump over here to the YouTube channel. This is the place where you get a lot more of the visual entertainment and kind of push these puzzle pieces together so you can kind of come along the journey on projects like what we talked about today. So hopefully you guys can do that. If you want to reach me, it is out there on Twitter, at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on TechPath.